and all these images. And I think I put a slide in here. I'm trying not to overwhelm me all the slides. Y'all just bear with me as I find the right little sweet spot to not do too many slides and just enough slides, right? But I, put, I think I put a slide in there, but I want to point out something to you. We're, we're again about to move into the judgment. A form of judgment. So we've already discussed the trumpets that was moving into judgment. And we already talked about the fact that before we got to judgment, we saw tribulation in the seals. And then we saw a type of what I believe was a rapture that we were seeing in the church. And then we moved into the wrath, which had to do with the trumpets. Now that we saw this again played out in chapter 14, where we saw what looked like a rapture, and then where we saw what looked like wrath, and we're going to go back and visit that again, and then now we're seeing this wrath take place. But look in the midst of this little chapter here that's showing us a scene in heaven before the plagues are poured out or the vials are poured out, whatever you want to call them. He says, I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now one thing that I just noticed today, and I'll, and I'll bring this up you know, I'll make this point because I didn't really have time to do a slide on it. But look, I want you to see that I just highlighted. They sing the song of Moses, who is the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Now, let me just ask you a quick question. This isn't a trick question. It's just trying to engage you in a little bit of conversation. If you don't feel like answering, you don't have to. I'll answer it for you at some point. When you, see, when you think of that and you say you, you see that they have hearts of God, they're singing the song, they're singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, what does that make you think when you see they're singing the song of Moses and they're singing the song of the Lamb? Because it just kind of hit me earlier today when I was reading it. Does something come to your mind? What, what it could be? When, you see, when you see somebody singing the song of Moses, what would you think about those people that are singing the song of Moses? If you had to think about them. Victory. I, I'm good with victory because Moses brought in victory. But see, to me, what, what I think of is I think of maybe, maybe I can't prove it, Old Testament saints. It's been a while since I've made this comment before, but before I came into the understanding of really the message of the finished work of Christ and understanding that we're to put our hope and trust in the Lamb, that I did not even understand that people that were in the Old Testament were still putting their faith in Jesus even, they didn't, even though they didn't know his name was Jesus. Right. You understand that? Well, how, what are you talking about? And we've talked about it many a time. That the seed and the sacrifice came together as one whenever Jesus went to the cross. What do you mean when you say the seed? In the beginning, God had been talking prophetically, even at the garden level, about the seed of the woman. And then he went into the seed of Abraham. Then he went into that it would come from Judah and that it would come from David. And then we learned that Jesus was the word that became flesh. So even in the Old Testament throughout, we see a stepwise approach, a methodical approach of God explaining to his people through the ages, even in the Old Testament, what the seed was going to look like. Now, to the Jewish mind, I need you to understand this, because this is very important for your understanding of the Bible as you continue to read it on your own. You don't have to raise your hand, but I hope you're reading the Bible on your own. That, that one of the things that you need to understand is this, is that to the Jewish mind, when you say the seed or you say Messiah, they, they were very clear that they were waiting on someone to come to deliver them. Now, many times, as in the instance of Jesus, when they first started to realize he may very well be the one. Blind Bartimaeus said, blind, not blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, <laughs> blind Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus said, son of David, have mercy on me. Okay. He connected Jesus as a descendant of David, and by him screaming that out in the streets, he was making reference to the fact that he believed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. Now, that may not mean a lot to you, but that's what it meant to a Jewish person. And so they were looking forward to the Messiah, the seed, when he would come. But guess what? They also, until he came, they didn't even necessarily always realize it. Even though God, through the prophets, spoke these things to them, they didn't always make the connection. 
What connection? That for sin, see, for deliverance, their king was going to come. He was going to be a descendant of David. But in their mind, they always, because the prophet also spoke about the day that Israel would be elevated. And that Israel would rule the nations, right? And so in their mind, they see that prophetic literature, and they're expecting their Messiah is going to come and be the king and deliver them from their bondage to Babylon, deliver them from their bondage to Assyria, or when the, Jesus, uh, the time frame of Jesus came, deliver them from the bondage of Rome. But they didn't understand that, that he, just like Satan tried to trick him into giving him the kingdoms without the cross, Jesus by that time understood, no, i got to go through the cross to do the will of my Father because I'm the servant that he sent. I'm the suffering servant that the Isaiah talked about in Isaiah 53. That, and, and I'm the suffering servant that was talked about in Psalm 22. They pierced my hands, they pierced my feet. And so what I need you to understand is, is that while they probably didn't make those connections, the seed and the sacrifice, it was the same plan of God. It's just that you and I have the luxury of looking backwards at what Jesus did and understanding he was the fulfillment of that. And the two came together as one at the cross. But even again, Isaiah 53, he told them 700 years before Jesus showed up that it was going to happen. Like a lamb he was led to slaughter. He, he had no beauty that we would desire him and that he was tormented, you know, and all of these things. And upon him, the iniquity of us all was laid upon him. And, 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 and again, you know, I'm just trying to make a point. So what, what I'm trying to tell you is with all that information, they sing the song of Moses. And I can't prove this, but to me it makes perfect sense. These people are in heaven right now. This is a scene in heaven. And that these people, are, what they're singing is, they have hearts in their hand. And they're singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Saying, great and marvelous are thy works. What I'm trying to make a point is, is this. Whoever these people are, I see a mixed multitude of both Old Testament saints and New Testament saints. Right? They're singing the song of Moses. They're singing the song of the Lamb. Hopefully it at least makes some sense. All right? Now, what that would tell you is, is that, and most people wouldn't have any argument with this, even people with a pre-tribulation rapture stance would say, well, yeah, we're getting into the wrath, the rapture is already taking place. Even, even if you're believing in a midweek rapture, by this time, the rapture is already taking place. So nevertheless, what we see here is a picture of believers singing the song of Moses, singing the song of the Lamb, saying, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are your ways, you King of Saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come to work, come and worship before you, and after and for your judgments are made manifest. Now, before we get to the last verse, I do want to point out to you that these people, um, and I know that this wouldn't go along with Old Testament saints, but what I'm trying to say is, is that I believe, because how would the Old Testament saints be, be there, because we've already covered this, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain, we're talking about the rapture. So those that died in the Old Testament, believing in the future plan of God, died in Christ and they would have been raptured first. Does that make sense? So, but look at this. Look, look what, what happened. They got victory over the deeds and over his image. So I'm telling so what I'm trying to say is that that, that would be the New Testament saints, and over his mark, and over the number of his name. And they stood on the sea of glass. Having the hearts of God. Okay? So I just want you to see that there's another sign in heaven where, where believers are, and the Bible is very explicit, that they overcame the beast and that they overcame in victory over the number of the beast. I wanted you to see that, right? All right, verse 5. After that I looked, behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials of the wrath of God. So it's already been called the plagues of God. Now we see these plagues are actually contained in vials, and that it's, it's spoken of as the wrath of God. Who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So we see here, we're just getting a description. That's why I told you if I was going to kind of like this 
try to explain to you what I, how to describe this chapter. It's just describing what's about to happen. So when we move into chapter 16, we're going to see those angels pour out those vials of wrath one by one. All right? So now we're going to just go ahead and go in. So chapter 15 serves mostly as an introduction to what the Bible calls the final judgments of the plague. So some of my main points today, I've already mentioned them. Biblical interpretation. i got to make this point again. The Bible must agree. Okay? The Bible must agree with itself. That means, yeah, I've been, I've been kind of pounding this whole midweek rapture is what I'm calling it versus the pre tribulation But that's just one example of how the whole of the Bible has to agree. And, and we have to have spent enough time. I hope this makes sense what I'm saying. We have to have spent enough time in the Bible to be able to even catch connections when we see something. that, And we have to be willing to, to, to have our mind to say... This maybe doesn't look like it's congruent or consistent with something else that I read in the Bible. And so therefore we must go to that spot and we must try to make sure that we're finding where the Bible is lining up. I hope that that makes sense to you. Now, I got to tell you that as hard as I try to do that about every little thing, you might grow weary with me just describing it to you. I try to do that with every little thing that I might not be certain of in the Bible. And sometimes I'll run into certain verses of Scripture that whenever it's all said and done, I still don't completely understand it right then and there in my walk with God. I'm willing to admit that to you, right? There's times that I spend a lot of effort trying to understand, and I know ultimately I need the help of the Holy Spirit to understand, and He's greatly given me understanding of the Bible, but even still with all of that, sometimes I don't understand it right then and there. And then I can tell you that there's been times a year later I would understand it. Two months later I would understand it, right? The main point I'm trying to make is, is that we're supposed to be, uh, as a disciple or, or a learner of Christ, really trying to make sure that the Bible is lining up. Okay. And one of the things that I want to discuss with you is connected to the correlation of the trumpets and the Bibles. Because in my opinion... Because I'm breaking it down and I'm not just taking one verse. See, that creates a problem with me. Because, and I'm going to explain to you why. If the trumpets and the vials aren't occurring together, there may be a problem with a pre, with a midweek pre-wrath rapture. Whenever we have two different spots that talk about the trumpets and the vials, you just got to take my word for it. We don't have time to go through all of it. I'm just telling you, for me, I'm like, this stuff has to line up. Okay, and so so that's what that's why I'm trying to bring these things out to you tonight. I want you to know that I am not just trying to make something up, but instead I'm going back and I'm trying to do some work. Now let's step, take a step backwards. Let's go back to Revelation 14, and this is the scripture that it says in Revelation 14 and 15. It says another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, "Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap." For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, you may not remember when we studied this, but I do. I remember very distinctly that I asked you, does this, what does this sound like to you? And many of you in the crowd said, the rapture. And it sounds even more like the rapture when you compare it to the next verse. Okay, because look, first of all, let's just understand. When you've read a lot about the Bible, then one of the things that you understand is that there is a common thing that goes throughout the Bible regarding harvest. Right? The seed of the gospel, like in the parable of the sower, the seed represents the word of God. And then we see all of the parables that talk about the harvest. You know, a sower, the, the parable of the sower, but then you have the parable of the wheat and the tares. And, and you know, that the wheat goes into the, is saved and the tares get burned up. And, you know, you got the parable of the the good man went on a long journey. There's just so many parables that talk about seed time and harvest. Even in the beginning in the book of Genesis, the word of God says that until, as long as there's an earth, there's going to be seed time and harvest. And we understand that, that physically there was going to be seed time and harvest. But can I tell you that the book of Genesis was, the whole earth was created for you and I to live on. And you can see that, that God created it. So whenever he says that there's going to be seed time and harvest, he's saying, yeah, to take care of human beings. But there's a spiritual implication that, that, that also souls are being won into the kingdom. We preached about that Sunday. The vine, the, the branch is connected to the vine 
and the end result is that fruit is ultimately produced. There you go. There's another one. Fruit. The vine. Being connected to the vine. Harvest. All right? So I want you to see that. For the, and there's coming a time whenever the angel's going to say, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come for you to reap the harvest of the earth. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Now, some people would say, well, how do we know that the harvest of the earth, that how we know that that's not judgment? Because in the next verse, it explains to us judgment. Right there, boom. The, I'm sorry, three verses later. At verse, chapter 14, verse 18. Another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle sent. That he says that there, another angel came out with another sickle. You got to go back and you got to read that. So this is two completely different scenarios. One has one sickle, and he's going to reap the harvest of, of the earth. And we already showed you this before. But look, in this one here, he says he had a, he had a sharp sickle. Thrust in your sharp sickle. If you got your Bibles, you can go back and you can double check them. All right. Well, no, let's just go ahead and read it. Okay, we can do this. Revelation chapter fourteen, and we're going to go. What was it? Verse uh, eighteen was this. Okay, and another one. Okay, and another angel. All right, here we go. Here it is. It says, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud. He said, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Not only that, let's go back a little bit further just so I can look at this. Verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. And I asked you last time, who do you think that is? And most of y'all said, Jesus. Having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle, and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. Again, bringing you backwards throughout all of the terminology of the Bible about seed time and harvest and about the word of God being a seed. And I've been trying to tell you for I don't know how long that there's going to be a great harvest on the earth. And the harvest is the souls of men. And that you and I as believers, God has allowed us to work the vineyard with him. Amen. He's allowing you and I to work with him. All right. So the harvest of the earth is ripe. Look, he said, he that sat on the cloud for us in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Boom! Rapture. That's what I'm trying to tell you that I see here. Now look at this. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust it in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the grapes, of the earth, for her grapes are fully left. Now, for me, I don't even need the next verse, but I'm about to give it to you. Because, see, for me, when I see that vine, it reminds me of John chapter 15 that we just preached. And it reminds me of being connected to the vine. And I don't know why this seems different to me than a harvest, but this cluster of the earth to me shows me a difference than what the harvest was. That the harvest was those that belong to God and that is vine of, of the earth. It's a vine of the earth. It's connected. Listen, it's, a, it's connected to the earth. I know what harvest is, but guess what? It, it was just harvest, and now it's no longer part of the earth, right? But this vine is connected. And look, her great, and look, the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. There you go. Two different angels, or two, two different people holding sickles, two different angels. Saying, go ahead, thrust in your sickle. One is a harvest. The other cast the vineyard of the earth into the great wine press of God. I don't think that there's any confusion on it, at least what the last one is. We should be able to see that. That's God saying, and, and I believe it's really clear, because I personally believe the rapture is going to happen. And immediately, and I believe that we pointed that out whenever we got into Revelation 6 area, when we got towards the end of the seals. And that basically, I believe, is going to start the same day. I believe seal six, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a little bit. Seal six happens the day the, the day of the Lord is coinciding with the rapture. And seal six happens, and the sun becomes darkened, and the moon becomes red, and the rapture is happening. At the, and at the same time, and then that's the beginning of where it was when the wrath of God is going to be poured out. I believe it's going to happen all at the same time. Does 
the ascension. It's very strong. All right? All right. So, so here, here's these scriptures. Showing you side by side the harvest of the earth, the clusters of the vine of the earth, right? And then I was going to show you, I've already done a better job just reading it to you, that I felt like there was a connection, like a showing you the difference between the clusters of the vine versus the harvest of the earth, which is you and I. I believe that. I believe that you and I are living on the earth, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. Amen? All right. And so, essentially, this, this next slide just basically said what I already told you, that the first scripture to your left represented the rapture, and that the scripture that was there to the right represented the wrath of God. All right, now let's go back to Revelation 15. And I want you to see this. It says that um, he, he saw another sign in heaven, great and mortal, the seven angels having the last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So immediately, I'm just telling you, like in my mind, I'm just... Asking you to walk with me through this. Immediately, I, I, if, I, if I'm a pre-tribulation person, I already got a problem. I'm about to poke holes in your in what you're believing with your midweek rapture, sir. Because you see right here, it says that that the seven last plagues for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So you're trying to say that the trumpets and the and the vials are happening together, but this is saying right here that the that the that the vials finish it up. Okay. Well I'm gonna I'm gonna take you where, where I go. See that's the kind of stuff that goes on in my brain. I don't know who goes on in your brain, but I'm constantly making sure that my stuff is right too. You see, I'm not just trying to make people believe whatever I'm believing. No, I'm over here trying to dissect all this stuff and make sure it lines up. All right, and so here it goes right here. This is the ESV version. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. Okay, so I'm, it's real plain, real plain that the plagues or the vials bring finality to the wrath of God, right? There's no question about that, the word God says. All right. So regarding trumpets and vials, the plagues and the vials refer to the same thing. Okay, in other words, the plagues and the vials, sometimes they're called the bowls in some translations. Some translations use the word bowls, vials, plagues, but they're being poured out as the wrath of God on earth. A significant point for a, I'm calling it a midweek rapture, you can call it an inter-seal rapture between seal 6 and 7, a pre-wrath rapture. I know that there may be people that have specific points that make them different, but I'm, that's how I'm calling it. Okay, must include attention to the trumpets and vials occurring in unison rather than apart. I'm, and I, I want to explain some of that. And let me, let me just stop right there and try to explain to you why. And you just got to take my word for this. If you're taking notes, you can write notes down. You can go back and you can watch the video later. You can pause it and take notes, right? The reason why it must happen is, is because of this. If you go back and you look at chapter 7, all right, when, and, and, we, and we get that, we got that picture. You remember that, that picture in heaven with 144,000? Y'all remember that was the first time I had a whole teaching on that. Chapter 7, there was the picture of the 144,000. And, and God, God told the angels, the angels on the four corners, not to begin to blow on the earth, not to allow the wrath to be released until the 144,000 were sealed in their heads. In that same chapter, we had a picture, I believe the whole scene is in heaven. Okay. We had another part to the scene where I was saying to you that I believe that those were the raptured saints. All right. They were dressed in white robes. They were from every tongue, tribe, nation, right? And they were giving worship to the Lord. They were worshiping the Lord. They were worshiping the Lord. All right. And so, but then after that comes, after that scene, the last seal is opened. And then the first trumpet is released. The first trumpet is blown, which begins the wrath of God. Okay. Well, so if you were really paying attention close and you were taking notes, what you would have realized is, is that when we got to chapter 14, which I just read to you, you remember that? When we read in chapter 14, we read, we said that throw in your sickle for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And then the next verse and another sickle was thrown in because... The vine of the earth was ready and it was thrown into the wine press of God. Then we said that that's a type of the rapture. Well, in that same chapter 14, before we got to that, it was another version of the 144,000. Okay? 
So what I made the point already was this, is that in chapter 7, you got the 144,000 and you have the rapture. And in chapter 14, you have the 144,000 and you have the rapture. All right? I know you uh, But guess what? You're not going to be here long tonight, so just try to stay with me. All right? Well, so after chapter 7, though, comes the trumpets. And after chapter 14 comes the Bibles. So how can it be showing you the same thing if the trumpets are coming here and then the Bibles are coming here? And that's the point that I'm trying to make is this. Is that if it's going to work, the whole Bible has to agree with itself. So then, and listen, nobody's been teaching that the trumpets and the Bibles will come together. I'm not that, I mean, I'm not saying nobody teaches it out there because I can tell you that there are people out there that teach it. But I would imagine most of the people in this church haven't heard it talk that way. If you've ever heard anything like that, you've ever heard it talk. Instead, at least even in my mind, I just thought the seals are here, and then the trumpets here, and then the vials here. What I'm trying to say is that, no, they're taking place together. And the reason why is, is that if, if they're not taking place together, then it does start to poke some holes in the midweek rapture fault. Okay? So... What are you doing, Matt? Are you just kind of like twisting things and putting them in order for it to work? No, I'm going to give you some scripture on why I believe it. Look, here we go. Look at this. Revelation 11, verse 15. I'm bringing you straight to the spot. Now, let me just make this clear. Are there scriptures where I can show you where it says, that, the, that specifically says, and the trumpet is blown, and then the vial is poured. And then the trumpet is blown, and then the vial is poured. No, I'm telling you right now, there's no scriptures that say that. There's also no scriptures that say that the trumpets and the vials did not coincide together. So what do you do? You find other scriptures in the Word of God that either support or tear down the thoughts that you're having. Right? Does that, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? In other words, you use scripture... To prove scripture. That's just a basic biblical interpretation tool. Scripture interprets scripture. Not what, not what Joe Blue down the road says. No, that's not proper biblical interpretation. I don't care how awesome he is. I don't care how long you've been listening to him. I don't care how much you love him. I don't care how much he ties you. That's not proper biblical interpretation. Biblical interpretation says the rule of law is scripture must be used to interpret scripture. And parts of scripture must be congruent or coincide with the whole of scripture. And the whole of scripture, well, let me just tell you, I got into an argument. I, I, well, I, he started to argue with me. All right. With a dude that was UPC the other night at work. The first time that I had a conversation with this dude, when he, when he started to show his colors... I said, I said, hey man, something came up, and I said, dude, that was a good conversation. And I went and I started, I started, you know, doing my, doing my work, okay? And because you know why? Because I've never been down this road, my friend. I haven't been down this road till I've exhausted myself. I have no strength left in me hardly anymore to talk to somebody of the UPC apostolic denomination or. I don't have hardly no strength anymore to talk to Jehovah's Witnesses. But guess what? As soon as another one comes. And it starts over again, I'm going to find my strength to be reinvigorated. Okay, but nevertheless, I'm not trying to get in an argument with nobody. I've been in the hospital where I'm working. As long as we're talking and we can talk about Jesus and, and it's going good, I'm good. But as soon as it's going south, I'm leaving. All right, well, so here we go. Sure enough, man, had a great day, working all day long, talking to bunch, multiple people about the Lord. And then all of a sudden... A brand new nurse in this little room where I am, and the other nurse comes in there, and he goes, he just said, yeah, me and Matt pretty much agree on almost everything. Now, this girl, first time I ever worked with her, I ain't never worked with her before. She don't know a first thing about Matt. Okay. She, I haven't even had a chance to tell her I love Jesus yet. And this dude comes in here, and he says that. And so the next thing you know, we're sitting here discussing stuff, and he gets up to go to the bathroom or something. I'm like, hey, listen, are you okay with this? Because, look, I can take this. I'll go, oh, no, no, you're fine, you're fine. But then the next thing you know, it starts getting out of hand. He starts getting louder. He's not in agreement with this, that, or the other thing. And he's got three scriptures that he keeps on going back to that they built this whole doctrine on. And I'm trying to say, but dude, what you're trying to say is contrary to the whole of the word.
Word of God. Basically, what you're doing now is you're saying that salvation includes water baptism, but includes a specific kind of baptism where you have to speak in other tongues. I'm like, wait, hold on a second. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, I don't believe that you're in filled with the Holy Spirit till you speak with other tongues. And what I'm trying to tell you is that that's not what we teach. What, what we teach is when you get saved, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. When you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's a second work of grace. You get filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. So he's saying you're not even, you're not, the Holy Spirit doesn't even live in you until you manifest speaking in other tongues. That's, that's completely contrary to the whole of the new covenant message. That's right. See, the Spirit of God dwelt with man because the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. Jesus being the fulfillment of the sacrificial system, when he shed his blood, now, the, now through faith, see it's through faith in Christ and the plan of God that a man is saved. And through faith the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of your heart. He said, no, 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 you need the Holy Spirit to live. I know you need the Holy Spirit to live for the Lord, but now you're turning the object of your faith into putting your faith in speaking in other tongues or putting your faith and you're leaving out what Jesus did at the cross. So finally, I did it. I did it. I'm probably going to say, why did you do it? Because I did it. It was, it was getting worse. He was getting louder. I said, dude, you ain't even living for the Lord right now. You're not even living for the Lord. I said it. You're not even living for the Lord right now. You're going to sit here and you're going to argue this point because he admitted to me. I ain't doing what's right, but I know what's right. Well, guess what? If I'm not doing what's right for the Lord at that point in time, I'm probably going to keep my mouth shut because I'm going to be ashamed. Okay, anyway, what is my point? My point is, is that the whole of Scripture has to align with the parts of Scripture. And the parts of Scripture have to align with the whole. That's the point that I'm trying to make. In everything, in everything that you believe, in everything that you seek to study about, in everything that you seek to believe regarding the Word of God. And then I went back the next time I saw him and I walked up to him and it was just him. And I said, look, boss, this is the thing. Anytime you and I want to have a conversation off the clock about the disagreements that we have about the Word of God, well, I'll spend hours with you in the parking lot, brother. And I said, as long as you and I can agree about Jesus in the Bible up in this place and you want to have some discussion about that, I'm perfectly fine with that. But whatever happened the other night should not never happen again between you and me in front of somebody else. I don't even know the Lord. He said, no, man, you're right, you're right. I'm just trying to make a point that, listen, you won't run into stuff that you don't always agree with something. But nevertheless, we got to remember that we are the children of the king and that our purpose here <laughs> is to work with Jesus for the harvest. And I can tell you, and I had to learn that the hard way. Robert will tell you, I'm over there arguing with people in shoes, man. I'm done with that. I got a ladder. He knows. We ain't gonna talk about that one. If you watch it, you know. All right. Now look. Now where are we coming back to? We're coming back to trying to make the point that the trumpets and the vials work together. Okay. When we get to maybe not next week, but when we get to chapter. 16, we're going to do it again. We're going to go trumpet, vial, trumpet, vial, and we're going to compare. Okay? But look what this says. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. So right now I'm just trying, because you remember the last thing I showed you was the vials are fill up the wrath of God. With the vials, the wrath of God is finished. Remember those scriptures? So I said in my mind, I get the picture that the, that the vials are the end of God's wrath. Okay? But I want you to see this. If they coincide the trumpets... And the Bible, look at what this scripture says. I brought you to the chapter where the last trumpet is blown. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So, I'm just asking you a question. Does this scripture not at least sound like when the last trumpet is blown, that there's a proclamation that's being made that now the kingdom of God, amen, is become the kingdom of the Son of God. So, so what I'm trying to say is now if you can imagine the trumpets and the vials going together, the wrath of God is being filled up between the trumpets and the vials. Okay? Here's another part to it. The seventh angel, I wanted you to see that. Blew that trumpet. All right, but here's the next the next verse. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. Listen, one thing I want to say real quick is, is this. 
One thing that we ought to all be agreeing to, we got to agree on all on this right here, what I'm about to tell you. That there is an ancient rebellion against your God. You hear me? There was an ancient rebellion in the garden. Well, there was an ancient rebellion that took place before the garden. There was a, that liar brought that rebellion into the garden. He caused a rebellion in humankind. And, and, and then there was a more rebellion at the Tower of Babel. And all this rebellion is against the God that you serve. And the enemy is trying to destroy the creation of God and trying to pull eternal souls away from the plan of God. And listen. Heaven's going to be so excited when the seventh trumpet blows. Heaven's going to, look at this, and the 24 elders that are in heaven who sit on our throne, they fell before God, they fell on their faces, and they worshiped God. And look what they said. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is, who was, for you have taken your great power and begun. I mean, it's been a while. This might even be the ESV version. It's, it's been a while since I tried to since I tried to uh, parse an English verb, but I'm pretty sure that's like a past participle that has to do with the fact that it started and it continues, or it, it, it's already started. Like you have begun to reign, all right? The nation's rage, that comes right out of Psalm chapter two. You know, that ought to be your homework tonight. Go read Psalm two, it's all about that thing. The nation's rage, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged. Does that not like, sound like the end, end terminology? Right? The nations came against you, but one day your wrath is coming. And your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints. And those who fear your name, both small and great. And for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So the main thing that I wanted you to see there before we get moving next is this. Is that how there can be. A coinciding of the trumpets along with the vials because we see the terminology. It would make sense, in other words, if it was trumpet one, vial one, based on that particular scripture. I might have to sell you on it, and that's okay. I'm not trying to convince you, but I'm trying to say there's scripture to back up that the blowing of the last trumpet is also connected to the end when Jesus begins to reign. That's what I wanted you to see. Now I'm just going to try to show you, I've already showed you this graphic before. Seven-year period is the last seven years that Daniel talked about. It's broken up into three and a half years. And the first aspect of it is the seal. We already talked about seal number one, the white horse, and that it represents the Antichrist coming into power. We also made a point that the tribulation is different than the wrath of God, right? So here is seal number two. It's the red horse, and that's supposed to be a tank. You probably can't see it. The first was a crown, okay, because it says the Antichrist is given a crown. The tank represents war. Okay, here's seal number three. The black horse, that's a scale, and that represents famine. Seal number four, the green horse, that represents death. Seal number five is the seal that describes the martyrs. When the seal is opened up, people that have a testimony of Jesus during this period of time, some will lose their life. The Bible says, Jesus said in Matthew 24, that some will be taken into captivity, and some will lose their life. If that has to do with a time frame that you and I may be alive for, then that's what it's saying. If if I'm right in this midweek rapture stuff, that's what it's saying. Right? That's why it's important. That's why it's important to know. And if nothing else, even if I don't, when it's all said and done, you don't believe the way I do, at least you've been in, I know I've said that before, but I can't get over it. That's why it's important. At least you've been introduced to, to, the, to the idea that you wouldn't just you wasn't just <coughs> behind and you felt like you were duped and you felt because listen along with that let me just say this along with that do you think that the devil's going to quit deceiving whenever like whenever but when he's uh, let's just pretend for a second this is why this is important let's pretend for a second in these 75 days that we found out of okay of what, what jesus called great tribulation Let, let's 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 pretend i'm right and, and, and all of a sudden, it's not like the whole world, they try to make you get a COVID shot. Okay. Now, they're, I'm, just, I'm just trying to create something in your mind. Now they're trying to tell you, no, you're going to get a shot to take care of your brother. But not only that, we're going to put a graphene tattoo on top of your hand that we can electronically trace you. In addition to that, we're also going to be able to put all your health care records. And now, 
all you're going to be able to do, this is just one scenario. I can't quit them going down like this. And now, all your movie is going to be interconnected. Let me just tell you what's going to happen if, you, if the church is still here. Okay, that's another thing I thought about. I'm reminded about that word church. Let me just tell you what's going to happen if the church is still here to see that. Whether you're at home with the Lord or not. Mass pandemonium. You, you, you think that there won't be fast pandemonium for all of the people that were taught all of their life and all they ever believed and considered was a pre-tribulation rapture and then all they're going to start believing that the whole thing was a fluke, that the Bible wasn't even real, and, that, and, and I'm telling you that, and how do you know that? Because... The Word of God says it in 2 Thessalonians 2, and we're going to talk about that next week, that there's going to great, be a great falling away. Some people say, oh, there's already a falling away. Yep, you better believe it, my friend, because there's so much garbage being preached. But I'm telling you right now, there's going to be a great falling away. The Bible says that brother is going to turn against brother, and then they will offer you up to be this, to be deceived, to be, to be maltreated. That I mean, I'm telling you right now, my own, I'm, I'm, hopefully, if you're watching, you don't get offended. My own daughter, she ain't serving Jesus, and this thing goes down, she might turn me in. People that you were going to church with, you understand you ain't got no food, you understand the time frame's a famine. The Bible says it's going to be a time that's worse than any time that's ever been on the face of the earth. I'm not trying to freak you out, I ain't trying to scare you, I'm trying to prepare your heart. There was a time in the Old Testament, whenever it was so bad that they, they came to King Solomon, if I remember it correctly. They came to the king with a baby in hand. And then, and then and they said, uh, or there are two different stories in the Old Testament, but the point is that two women had made a deal. Yeah. And, and what they said was, we made a deal. We were going to eat her baby today, that's what it said, and then we were gonna, she was going to eat my baby tomorrow. And we ate my baby, but now she won't give me her baby to eat. That's how bad it was. That was the people of God. And the Bible says it's going to be worse than that. Yeah. The famine is going to be worse than that. Oh, you're a fear monger. No, I ain't no fear monger. I'm trying to tell you. That's why it has to be understood. That's why it has to be at least grasped in your mind. To where you can prepare your heart. Prepare your mind. That if, and, and that's why you go through the scriptures. That's why you dissect them. That's why you look and you make sure that the hole is lining up with the part. And the parts are lining up with the whole. Because I was reading a book that Aaron got me the other day called The uh, Parable of the Fig Tree. And it was one of the writings for one of the disciples. And it said, prepare your heart. <laughs> because listen, it won't profit you anything. If you live for the Lord the whole time. And then in the end, you, 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 gave, you gave in. You didn't serve him until the very end. It's not going to profit you. One little bit. Oh, it would be easy to be an American Christian. I grew up in a country where Jesus spoon fed it. It was being spoon fed Jesus from the time that I was just a little toddler in a poopy diaper. And I was just able to live for Jesus so easy. No persecution. No, no hard times. And then in the end, boom, whenever I was tested. You see, that's why maybe the church would be. Because people would say also. Why does the church have to go through this whenever they took the wrath? When Jesus took our wrath, we've already made it clear. The wrath is the last 3.5 years. The first 3.5 years is, is tribulation. And tribulation is, can be man-made. And it looks like it's man-made in the Bible. But the wrath is coming from God. And you don't have to receive wrath because Jesus right. took your wrath right. upon him. But that doesn't mean you won't have to face tribulation. Well, why would God cause his people to... Why would God Paul to be killed by Nero. Well, well, why didn't Paul, the God, allow Mark to be, I don't know, I keep saying it to y'all, but drove through the streets of Egypt behind the chariot. Why did God allow Thomas, the very one that stuck it, he offered to stick his hand in his side to be, to be killed with an Indian, a Brahmin sword? Why, why would God allow such a thing? They took a stand against the world. And they said, no, I'm going to hold on to my Jesus. And I just want to encourage you, again, you know, the preacher, you know, like this is going to happen tomorrow. I don't know when it's happening, but I will tell you this. If he gave them the grace that they needed to endure the trial, if he gave them the grace that they needed to, to live for Jesus to the very, very end, he will give you the grace that you need to face whatever persecution. And if you and I don't ever have to worry about it, 
And we go on to be with the Lord because we die of old age. Praise God. And to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And we walk the streets of gold. Hallelujah. Praise God. But maybe somebody will happen to stumble across this teaching along with the other teachings that are out there that will at least plant a seed Amen. in the head and say, hey, you need to rethink it. Amen. You need to rethink it. Because we see some crazy stuff going on. Alright, so here we go. Seal number six, what I'm trying to tell you is the 75 days takes place first. Seal number six comes and then boom, the sun is darkened, the moon becomes red like blood, and then I'm saying at the same time, I don't know if it's the same exact day, I'm just trying to say, the day of the Lord. I believe the day of the Lord, wrath is poured out, and at the same time, because, listen, I just want you to know, darkened sun and red bloody moon is throughout the night. To the book of Joel. It's, it's, it's all over the world. And it represents the judgment of God. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that it would make sense. I think Aaron said it. Some other people said it to me before. On the same day that Noah entered the ark, the rain fell, the ground broke up. On the same day that Lot and his family left Sodom, the Lord rained down fire and brimstone. On the same day. And so it makes sense. That, does that prove it? Absolutely. No. But what I'm trying to make a point is there's scriptural reference to make the point that it could be that. Right? So there's the rapture. All right. And then here we go. I'm about to move it quick. Here's the rap. Seal number seven. I told you earlier. Seal number seven actually opens up and shows you trumpet number one. And then here you go. Trumpet one. Bible one. See there? Trumpet three, vial three. Trumpet four, vial four. Trumpet five, vial five. You get it. Six, seven. All right, I got another one here that's a lot faster. All right. Um, and, 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 but I'm just trying to make the point. Here's the midpoint. There's that 75. There's the rapture. Boom. Seal number seven, and then it goes. So you see a big picture of it is what I'm trying to say. Tribulation and wrath. All right? And, and so I wanted you to see that. Now we're about to close it up. All right? Y'all ready? And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. I got to tell you that coming up before long... I'm going to offer to have like a little, I don't know exactly how I'm going to do it, but there's a book that I'm going to, uh, that I recently read, and, and it has to do with the nations, and it has to do with the ancient rebellion against God, and I'm going to offer, if people want to, I'm going to call it a class, and if people want to take the class, they're going to buy the book, the church will buy the book, and we'll probably meet twice a month on Sunday nights at the church, and then maybe I'll do two times a month on, you know, video, you know, to try to take it easy on them. Right? And if you want to, then you can sign up and we'll, we'll get the book for you. But the, but the essence of what it's going to be teaching is this. It's going to talk about, O oh, king of the nations. You see, the other nations that have rebelled against God. We're going to go back to the, to the concept of the Tower of Babel. And we're going to see, but not only that, we're going to see in the Bible where this is a repeated thing. That the people groups have rebelled against God. And that God, in response, turned them over. But at the same time, created a nation for himself. And that through that nation, gave the world Jesus. Amen. And now, according to even the letter written to Peter, that he has, he is creating a, 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 a peculiar people, a holy nation that should show forth the praises of him. What I'm trying to explain to you right here is this, that the heavens see Jesus as the king of the nation. For right now, the nations are in rebellion against Jesus. And I just want you to see how many times can you find scriptures that, that, that go along with this thing. And what does that mean to you in your life as you've given your heart to Jesus? What does that mean? It's a reminder that God has allowed you and I to work with him. Whether it's one soul at a time, right? One, one whatever, at a time. To be faithful. To the call that he has given us, each and every one of us, to, to live for the Lord. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. 
Amen. Revelation 15, 2. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those, I, I just wanted to point that out again. Those who had conquered the beast. Isn't that something? See, God, part of the testimony and part of the trial of going through the persecution is like the, the Hebrew boy Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When Nebuchadnezzar made that golden image and all those sixes are connected to it, right? He's 60 feet high, he's 6 feet wide. There's six musical instruments. When the instruments play, bow down. Worship the image of Nebuchadnezzar or else you're going to get thrown into the fire. Well, the three Hebrew boys said, no, we ain't going to worship that image. Now, if that ain't some context to point out, the people of God are a witness in the land caught up in the midst of the world and the world says you will worship the image or else you will die. And God's people say, no. Yeah, how, many, how many Hebrew boys do you think probably did worship the image of that day? You think that Shadrach, I'm telling you right now, there was plenty of them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said no. Just like Daniel, he said no. And he stood. Amen. They had conquered the beast and said, what a beautiful testimony for the Lord when it's all said and done. <laughs> that God's people withstood what the beast <laughs> threw at them. And he ain't ever going to ask nobody to do nothing on their own. They conquered the beast in its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with hearts of God in their hands. There's another translation that says, to them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark. It's interesting to me that we get a picture of people with hearts singing a song, giving glory to God, who are described as those who got victory over the beast, and the next scene is the wrath of God. This is all, you have to go back and you have to study it out again, but it's all lining up. Seal number five, the martyrs. Seal number six. The sun turns to black and the moon turns to blood. And then the rapture takes place in chapter 7. And then the wrath comes. It, it's, it all lines up according, according to even something similar. Just a, a snapshot of chapter 15 is telling the same story again. Because the wrath is about to be poured out again in chapter 16. It keeps on repeating itself. It keeps on repeating itself. <coughs> Revelation 15, 5. After this, I looked at the sanctuary of the tent of witness, and heaven was open, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. Father, we just thank you.